So good morning. Um, welcome. My name is Samuel Goldman, and I am an assistant professor of political science here at George Washington University, uh, where I'm also director of the Politics and Values Program. Uh, in addition, I'm a contributing editor at the American Conservative Magazine, so it is with very great pleasure on behalf of both George Washington University and the American Conservative um, that I welcome you to this conference. Um, this is actually the second uh, cooperative event between the American Conservative and the Political Science Department at George Washington University. Uh, about 18 months ago, uh, some of the people who are here today met in this very room to consider new directions for American foreign policy. The ideas discussed were sometimes unconventional, uh, but I think that the general mood at that time was optimistic about the possibility of revising some of the assumptions and policies that have led the United States into inconclusive wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as more limited conflicts elsewhere. It's not quite so easy to be optimistic today. Um, the presidential campaign seems to have given new life to the old consensus in favor of more military spending, uh, greater intervention abroad, uh, and what I believe is likely to follow, more war. And in an age of ostensibly unprecedented polarization, uh, it's important to remember how bipartisan this consensus is and continues to be. Uh, it was not Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio, uh, but Hillary Clinton, who recently described the bombing of Libya as smart power at its best. But there are also reasons to hope uh, that change may come sooner rather than later. Uh, in different ways, so-called outsider candidates, from Bernie Sanders to Donald Trump, uh, have raised hard questions about the purpose and limits of American power. Academics, journalists, and policy experts have also continued the debate, proposing cheaper, less violent, and above all, more effective ways of pursuing our national interests. Uh, so while it is doubtful, I think, that Libya is the best example, uh, Hillary Clinton is right about something. If we want to be stronger, we also must become smarter. Uh, and this conference, I think, will help us to do so. So you will hear from some of the leading figures in these debates uh, today in panels on conservative realism, how foreign policy really gets made, the state and modern war, uh, and the influence of religion on U.S. foreign policy, uh, the speakers will consider not only where we should go, but also how we got here. These are sure to be rewarding and provocative discussions. Uh, and I should mention that the opportunity to uh, hold them under the auspices of George Washington University and the Political Science Department reflects commitments to vigorous debate and open-ended inquiry uh, that characterize the university at its best. So I am grateful to them for uh, inviting us uh, to gather here today. Um, I would also like to thank the Charles Koch Institute for making this event possible. So thank them and thank you for joining us and welcome to the conference. Thank you. Well, and thank you, Sam, for those opening remarks. Uh, my name is Daniel McCarthy. I am the editor of the American Conservative Magazine. And before we begin this morning, I want to extend a special recognition and thanks to the Charles Koch Institute and to the Department of Political Science here at uh, the George Washington University for sponsoring, uh, co-sponsoring this event and making it possible. I also wish to thank uh, Plow Publishing, our gold sponsor, for also uh, contributing to this, uh, making this event uh, happen. 
We have with us today as our opening speaker someone who not only knows the tradition of uh, American realism and restraint, and who not only knows the tradition uh, that conservatives have uh, exhibited within um, that tradition of restraint and sensible foreign policy, someone who not only knows these things but exemplifies them. Uh, Congressman John Duncan, who represents the 2nd District of Tennessee, is the last remaining Republican in Congress who had voted against going to war with Iraq in 2003. Uh, this shows how Congressman Duncan is not only a true conservative, someone who has been a leader in terms of fighting government waste and unnecessary spending, but someone who has even bucked the uh, conservative establishment and his own party and his own president when it comes to matters of principle in foreign policy and has been willing to take unpopular stands and take the, uh, the hits that have come with them. Uh, Congressman Duncan is a, uh, uh, a native of Tennessee. He's also a graduate of the George Washington University Law School. He is someone who I think exemplifies local patriotism at its best. Congressman Duncan. Daniel, thank you uh, <clears throat> very much. And I would like to uh, open up this conference by reading words from a very famous speech. We must face the fact that the United States is neither omnipotent nor omniscient that we are only 6% of the world's population, that we cannot impose our will upon the other 94% of mankind, that we cannot right every wrong or reverse each adversity, and that therefore there cannot be an American solution to every world problem. Those are words from President John F. Kennedy in a speech given at the University of Washington in 1961. And I think they exemplify the work of the American Conservative Magazine and what this conference is about. And I, I need to, first of all, I guess, thank uh, <clears throat> Daniel McCarthy for the invitation and for the kind introduction. I've always said that I appreciate being introduced. Uh, uh, several years ago, I presented a flag at the Rogers Creek Elementary School in my district in East Tennessee. And after I'd done that in front of all the students out in front of the school, one of the first grade teachers asked me to stop by her class. And when I walked in, she said, now, boys and girls, do you remember who this is? And one little fellow raised his hand in kind of a scared voice. He said, are you the man on the nickel? And uh, so I tried to explain I was not the man on the nickel. I read a quote from uh, uh, John Kennedy but I also want to read something from my friend David Keene, who is the opinion editor of the Washington Times and a longtime leading conservative. He wrote recently, the concept of U.S. national interest was stretched beyond any rational meaning with the argument that democracies don't go to war with democracies. So rebuilding the world in our own image was seen as our ultimate national interest. America took on more than we could possibly handle. The result is a generation of young Americans who have never known peace, a decade in which thousands of our best have died or been maimed with little to show for their sacrifices, our enemies have multiplied, and the national debt has skyrocketed. And I think that pretty well sums up my views on our efforts in the Middle East over the past uh, many years. Also, uh, uh, Thomas Sowell, who's a favorite columnist of mine, and I assume many people here, wrote uh, uh, not too long ago. He said, going back to square one, what lessons might we learn from the whole experience of the Iraq war? If nothing else, we should never again imagine that we can engage in nation building in the sweeping sense that term acquired in Iraq, least of all building a democratic Arab nation in a region of the world that has never had such a thing in a history that goes back thousands of years. Daniel mentioned to you, or said to you in the introduction that uh, he felt I had followed a uh, traditional conservative position in some of my actions in the Congress. When, they found, when the White House found out many years ago that I was leaning against voting against going to war in Iraq, they called me down to a little secure room at the White House with Condoleezza Rice and George Tenet, who was the head of the CIA, and John McLaughlin, who was his um, uh, top uh, assistant. And I asked, uh, there was a, a front page story in the Washington Post, uh, I think that day or the morning before, uh, where Lawrence Lindsay, the president's uh, economic advisor, uh, said that a war with Iraq would cost us uh, $200 billion. I asked about that, and Condoleezza Rice 
said that, um, uh, oh no, it wouldn't cost that much. It would be 50 or 60 billion, and we get a lot of that back from our uh, uh, allies. I think that had to be the greatest underestimate in the history of uh, federal estimates, which is saying a lot. <clears throat> I, I asked uh, ask him if you can get past the traditional conservative positions of being against massive foreign aid, which this uh, going to war in Iraq would, would have uh, caused us to have to do. If you could get past the traditional conservative position of being against a huge deficit spending, which this obviously was going to add to, if you could get past the traditional conservative position of, of conservatives being the biggest critics of the UN, and uh, we were going to war to enforce UN resolutions, and if you could get past the traditional conservative position of being of conservatives being against uh, uh, the U.S. being the policeman of the world. If you could get past all those traditional conservative positions, did, you, did they have any evidence of any imminent threat? And they didn't. And in fact, that was confirmed in a speech that George Tenet gave at Georgetown University the day after he uh, uh, resigned. But, of course, as you know, we went on to war. There were six, uh, six Republicans who voted against going to war. And we have learned some uh, uh, very difficult and very costly lessons from that experience. Even William F. Buckley, uh, 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 of course, the icon for conservatives, who at first was for going to war in Iraq, wrote later, he said, a respect for the power of the United States is engendered by our success in engagements in which we take part. A point is reached when tenacity conveys not steadfastness of purpose, but misapplication of pride. It can't reasonably be disputed that if in the year ahead the situation in Iraq continues as bad as it has done in the past year, we will have suffered more than another 500 soldiers killed. Where there had been skepticism about our venture, there will then be contempt. And I think that uh, um, pretty well summed up the situation several years ago, and of course we remained in Iraq for many years uh, later on. I spoke, uh, uh, I wrote an article for the magazine, and let me, uh, let me just stop right there and, and say to you how much I appreciate the American Conservative magazine. I appreciate the uh, job that uh, Daniel does and all of the editors. I appreciate uh, uh, John Basil Utley, the publisher. Uh, that is a voice that needs to be, uh, uh, theirs is a voice that needs to be heard and more in this city. And in fact, uh, I'm saddened by the uh, neoconservative domination of, of U.S. foreign policy over these last uh, uh, many years. Um, uh, George Will, in a column that he wrote not long ago, he said that uh, neoconservatives were magnificently misnamed and that they actually were the most radical people in this town. But uh, we have, uh, I hope, uh, learned some lessons uh, uh, from all this. And I hope that we can get back to a traditional conservative position. Uh, Senator Robert Taft once uh, said, no foreign policy can be justified except a policy devoted to the protection of the liberty of the American people, with war only as the last resort, and only to preserve that liberty. Georgianne Geyer, uh, uh, the respected foreign policy columnist, uh, said Americans will inevitably come to a point where they will have to choose between a government that provides services at home or one that seeks empire across the globe. And I remember when, uh, when I first uh, came to Congress, I came as a, <clears throat> as a traditional Republican. Uh, I believe that the uh, uh, Democratic-controlled Congress had, uh, had uh, cut uh, defense spending, and I repeated all, that, uh, all those uh, uh, sayings. I believed everything that the uh, military-industrial complex uh, uh, said, and um, uh, Daniel didn't tell you this, but I voted for the first Gulf War back in the early 90s because I went to all the briefings by uh, General Schwarzkopf and the Secretaries of State and Defense, and I heard them talk about um, um, uh, Saddam Hussein's elite troops and how dangerous they were and, and how he would probably take over the entire Middle East and so forth. 
And then I saw those same elite troops surrendering to CNN cameras in empty tanks. And I thought then that the threat had been greatly exaggerated. Going on down, I was speaking at a conference at the Greenbrier, uh, and I read a front page article one day in, uh, during the, uh, the years uh, between the two Gulf Wars, two uh, Iraq Wars, and I read that uh, we, uh, we were enforcing a no-flight zone in Iraq and bombing on the average of every fourth day, and it was costing uh, millions of dollars a day, and I was... Uh, concerned about that because it was a forgotten war at that time. Nobody even knew we were still bombing. And then I remembered, uh, then I, uh, uh, a couple of years after that, I read a front page article in the Washington Post in, in which it said that one of our bombs had gone astray and killed seven little boys who were playing soccer in a field in Iraq. And they told in this story of the horrible anguish of, the, of a father of one of the little boys whose head had been blown off by one of our bombs. And so uh, 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 we come on down to the, uh, t the second Iraq war, and I had, by that time, I decided uh, to read everything I could get my hands on, and I read, uh, uh, I read an article in Fortune magazine that said that, uh, we win, what then? And it said that a prolonged, that this, uh, that a war, in, a second war in Iraq would require a prolonged occupation and would inevitably make American soldiers sitting ducks for Islamic terrorists. And that's, those were the words that they used. U.S. News and World Report at that time had an article that said, why the rush to war? And I think that's, uh, I think that's what we did. Uh, it, uh, uh, and it was, uh, 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 I'm not trying to make myself sound heroic, but uh, uh, it was a difficult vote because I represent a very conservative, very patriotic, very pro-military district. And the night before our vote to go to war, I had been um, given a poll uh, in my district that said 74% of the people in my district were in favor of the war, 9% were against, and 17% were undecided. And so I wondered if I was... Uh, uh, um, ending my political career. And for about the first three or four years after I'd done that vote, which did shock my district, uh, I, uh, I had people, um, uh, uh, many people who told me they were very opposed to what I had done, and uh, I had a man who ran against me totally on the war. Uh, he's now the mayor of one of our um, um, fastest growing towns, a suburb of Knoxville. Uh, but uh, uh, what, had, what had been, without any question, the most unpopular vote I ever cast in the Congress, and I've cast a lot, um, slowly, slowly, slowly became one of the most popular. And I put uh, in one of my newsletters, I put the, uh, something President Reagan once uh, uh, wrote, and he, he, had, he set forth four principles for war. He said, the United States should not commit its forces to military action overseas unless the cause is vital to our national interest. If the, two, if the decision is made to commit our forces to combat abroad, it must be done with the clear intent and support needed to win, and there must be clearly defined and realistic objectives. Three, before we commit our troops to combat, there must be reasonable assurance that the cause we are fighting for and the actions we take will have the support of the American people and Congress. And four, even after all these other tests are met, our troops should be committed to combat abroad only as a last resort when no other choice is available. And so uh, when I read to you, statements by Mr. Republican Robert Taft saying we should only go to war as a very last resort. And when I read to you a statement from President Reagan saying the same thing, I'm saddened that we don't seem to be following that now. I, it is unfortunate, I think, that, that uh, most of the leading candidates uh, from my party um, uh, seem almost uh, too eager to um, be ready to go to war to um, hawkish because I don't believe that is a traditional conservative uh, position. And fin finally, I'll just say one more thing, and they want me to take a few questions, but Daniel talked about uh, um, 
continually increasing defense spending. And of course, we spend more on defense than most of the other nations in the world combined. But there is a, a, a section of, of a book by Evan Th Thomas called Ike's Bluff, which I read about Eisenhower's foreign policy. And in my opinion, Eisenhower has, uh, looks a lot better with the passage of time. But uh, it says in this book, when Defense Secretary Neil McElroy warned him that further budget cuts could harm national security, Eisenhower acerbically replied, if you go to any military installation in the world where the American flag is flying and tell the commander that Ike says he'll give, them an extra, give him an extra star for his shoulder if he cuts his budget, there'll be such a rush to cut costs that you'll have to get out of the way. Thomas added that Eisenhower would periodically sigh to Andy Goodpaster, his chief of staff, God help the nation when it has a president who doesn't know as much about the military as I do. And I think that's a, 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 I think it's unfortunate that we have too many chicken hawks who really don't know that much about the, uh, about the military. Finally, I'll close just by uh, telling you a story that uh, my longtime friend, uh, uh, a man I really admired, Senator Howard Baker, uh, told about his, uh, uh, his first speech in the United States Senate. He said he spoke for, for well over an hour, and he covered every issue that he could think of. And he said uh, after it was over, he said there were only two people on, in the Senate uh, chamber, uh, his father-in-law, Everett Dirksen, and the Democrat who was in the chair. And he said he went to his father-in-law and Senator Dirksen uh, he asked Senator Dirksen what he thought, and Senator Dirksen said, Howard, you might occasionally want to enjoy the luxury of an unexpressed opinion. <laughs> and, uh, and I will tell you one other story that many, many years ago when I was, uh, uh, just as I was being introduced to speak to the First Baptist Church of Alcoa, Tennessee, my son Zane, who's now 29 and is having today his uh, second son, my ninth grandchild in Knoxville. Um, his wife's having his second son, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, when Zane was 13, he leaned over to me as I was being introduced and he whispered very emphatically, he said, Dad, when you get up to speak, speak for three minutes. Do not speak more than three minutes. And I whispered back and said, why, Zane? And he said, because your speeches are boring. <laughs> and, I, and I told that story to a Lions Covered Dish Supper about four, three or four years later, and a little Cub Scout named Nick Angel, whose name I'll never forget because of what he said to me, he came up to me and he said, uh, he surprised me, he said, uh, Mr. Duncan, your speech was good. And that part surprised me, but then he said, your son was right, it was boring, but it was short. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll stop there and thank you, Daniel. And um, well, you still want me to take well, um, or have, I've gone too long? Well, no, no. Okay. I, I, what I wanted to do is uh, I wanted okay. to thank you for showing okay. us how a man of conscience uh, can serve the public. And I think that your remarks well, today well, thank you. were, were beautiful and, and comprehensive. And, okay. Um, so uh, thank you again. And, okay. Well, uh, we thank look forward to having you. Okay. Well, thank future. you very much. Thank you.